So thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, we are so grateful to be here and learn from Mark this evening. Um, we are, Food Shed Alliance is hosting this webinar through a grant called Transition to Organic um, Protocols Program. This is a new USDA program and or initiative that's investing to provide education, technical assistance, and support to help producers uh, transition to organic practices. Um, TOPP, as they're called, is um, that the their partners are offering farmer to farmer me mentoring, training, and technical assistance, community building, and workforce development and training. So we including this webinar, we will have um, quite a few training and educational opportunities as well as community events coming up um, through this grant. And partners through the top program will also have all of the things I just mentioned. So I will drop a link in our chat on um, some more information about them if anybody's interested in learning more. Um, so yeah, so tonight we are gonna talk about organic certification and we're really excited to have Mark Keating here. Mark is originally from New Jersey. Um, he's been working in organic, local and sustainable agriculture for the past four decades. Mark actually got his start working in restaurants and worked his way back through food processing to start working on family fruit and vegetable farms. He then trans transitioned into policy work and has worked in the nonprofit, government service, journalism, and commercial sectors ever since. Mark spent seven years working at USDA in Washington, including two stints with the National Organic Program. And currently Mark splits his time between roughly 175 crops, livestock, and handling inspections with consult and um, supplementing with consulting and writing. So he considers himself both a proponent and a critic of organic certification. Um, and I will let him take it away from here. Um, he created a nice outline for us. So I will drop a link in the chat uh, for that as well for anyone who wants to kind of follow along. So take it away, Mark. Thank you, Tess. And uh, thanks everyone for finding the time and to participate in this conversation about the pros and cons of organic certification. Um, yes, I am a big proponent of organic certification, uh, especially, well, I like to create a distinction between organic farming and organic certification. Uh, organic farming is uh, traditional agricultural pra practices, pretty much common to every corner of the globe uh, that our ancestors developed and refined over thousands of years. Uh, I strongly believe that we will never have a sustainable food system until we have uh, organic practices re reintroduced. Um, the world's, I'm not looking back or seeking to go back in time, but the practices of uh, organic farming practices are, are essential. The way that we can farm and still have uh, the resource base available to us to farm uh, next year. Organic certification is narrower. Uh, it's a federal process verification program. Uh, I am a critic uh, in some regards. I think um, like a lot of things emanating out of Washington, uh, there are there's a little bit of a distortion. Some of that's natural. Um, the system, it's hard to create an absolute level playing field. Um, and some of it is just bureaucratic in nature. Uh, program can have some uh, obstacles, uh, some uh, dead ends. Uh, and the message, the first and foremost message that I'd like to deliver is that uh, for farmers uh, who are considering organic certification, it's very important to take a, a commercial, um, to, to get a clear commercial understanding of pros and cons. Uh, I do help farmers write organic system plans. I do a lot of organic inspections. Um, there is an economic opportunity for a farmer to, one, uh, gain uh, increased revenue, higher price for their product, 
or uh, to gain access to a market that would otherwise not be available to them. You have uh, your farming, you have a conventional product, um, you are at an impasse on the marketing side, there's an opportunity for the product were to be certified, then that is, uh, those are the two primary considerations, higher price or uh, uh, a new market. That has to be weighed against uh, a number of factors. First and foremost, what will it mean to be certified organic? Um, how compatible is that with your current operation, your current practices and materials? Uh, and two, what will the time and uh, expense and uh, associated headaches of the certification process. Uh, you want to weigh that together. You kind of want to want to weigh the costs, both uh, uh, economic and uh, psychological, against the potential benefit. And and I really ask farmers who are looking at certification to to do a good calculation. I'm not necessarily a fan of of certification for certification itself. Um, that can be um, uh, that not to say that it doesn't uh, serve a purpose, but I really, first and foremost, it's so important that farmers and their activity, their work as a business and keep the focus on a cost benefit analysis. Uh, we have a relatively small audience tonight. What I'd like to suggest is, is that if individuals have questions uh, about anything that I'm speaking to, or if they have uh, specific areas of interest, um, please put that in the chat box. Tess is uh, more of a 21st century person than I am. I'm kind of a I'm kind of a technology uh, retrograde, I guess you'd say. I don't have very good technological skills, so Tess is going to monitor the chat session. I really do not want to listen to my spell, mis listen to myself speak uh, for the next 45 minutes. Um, so please um, feel welcome to participate. Uh, you're welcome to participate with questions, with observations, uh, point me in a direction you're, you're interested in. Uh, and I, I really like a dialogue as a monologue. Uh, any, uh, before we kind of start, Moving into the, uh, we already discussed why, which is in the uh, outline I share with you, why to become certified organic. We're going to start moving into more of the technical side, the how question. Uh, but let me let me ask if anybody has any uh, comments up front, anything to share up front. Hey, Mark, I'll um, get to it when you can. This is John. Um, John Clutie. Hey, John. Get to, hey, good evening. Um, get to it when you can, but I'd be interested in knowing more about um, sort of the certification process for uh, a university and for a hydroponics facility. Um, my wife has uh, both uh, at her disposal, as a matter of fact. So uh, over time, it doesn't have to be right now. And uh, then the other thing I'd be interested in is the uh, I was going to put this in the chat, but you beat me to the, you know, you paused. So I thought I'd just ask. Uh, the other thing I'd be interested in is talking about the, uh, let's see here, the, uh, I'm terrible with acronyms, but it's the the plan, the organic systems plan, OSP, and the components yes. of that. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, let's, let me take a quick look at that. Yes, the, uh, do, uh, one of the great things about the organic certification process is that USDA is, is uh, setting standards. These are the practices uh, that are allowed, practices that are prohibited, uh, materials which can be allowed, prohibited, or restricted. The actual setting of the standards is what you'll find. Uh, that is the domain of Washington, D.C. Um, and the day-to-day, year-to-year compliance activity resides with what we'll call uh, a certifying agent. And, oh, I see an, an observation here from Jason on the subject of organic 
I'm going to track this one right away because it's important. On the Federation of Organic for Organic Sake, while economics are important, what about the simple fact that the Farm Bill historically vastly under allocates funding towards organics? Isn't part of the reason is that so many people farm organically but do not certify? Uh, yeah, there's a lot of merit in what you're suggesting. Um, and you do, this is a good, a good, um, uh, a good moment to add this. You, depending on your, the, the, uh, um, the rated on your farm, you can farm organically without being certified. It's called a small farm exemption. It puts you, uh, the ceiling on that is $5,000 in sales. So it is a commercial activity, more of a part-time opportunity, I'd say, than, than, a, than, a, a, than a, a, a commercial farm. I think it is important. Um, also, what you're saying about marshalling support for organic agriculture in Washington, in the Farm Bill, um, it's tough. Uh, Washington, and I worked in Washington for a total of eight years, uh, six, uh, uh, excuse me, five at USDA and uh, three in, in other settings, two uh, nonprofit settings. It, it's definitely, uh, it's a little bit, well, it's more than a little bit David versus Goliath in Washington. It's uh, it's a town where the uh, industrial agricultural interests, and I have no objection to, I'm not saying industrial, pejoratively i never i'm a big tent person i am very receptive to farmers doing what they feel is necessary and within the bounds of the rules and the regulations to make their farm successful uh so i'm not trying to create a division here but yes in terms of uh resources and attention um we tend to draw the short end of the stick i'm not sure uh, good question there on uh, can you point us towards some tools or resources to help us determine if the cost of certification will be justified for an operation, uh, worksheets or tools? That is uh, an excellent question going right to the root of the issue. I don't have anything at that disposal. Um, I will be able to give you a rough cost of what the certification will generally what certification will cost, but I can't, I don't have any way of, I think you could be able to work backward from that figure um, and determine if the added value merit the, um, the investment. Um, but thank you, please keep the questions coming and I'll try to focus as much as I can in that context. Um, The certifying agent is uh, a third party entity. They're independent from USDA. They uh, apply to USDA to become, a, to be a certifying agent. That's it, they're, and they're accredited by USDA to serve that role. Your license, and they're the ones responsible for the day-to-day, year-to-year compliance activities with the farmer. And it's it's been a great model. Uh, USDA could never have, uh, staffed up or scaled up their uh their the, with using usda employees to do this work there was a pre-existing private organic sector uh, that was ready to carry on their work there have been new entry organic certifying agents also it's created a marketplace for organic so you have an option uh new jersey there's probably uh, I could identify half a dozen certifying agents that um, operate uh, on crops and livestock inspections just in New Jersey. And regionally, if we added Pennsylvania, I could probably get up to 10. And they're all, um, because it's an open marketplace, they they are competitive. And that makes them service-oriented. And they also can kind of tailor their service to uh, the needs of a particular customer. For example, some sort of kind of refer to them as the Cadillac service. You're paying a Cadillac price, but you're getting, in principle, something a little bit more um, support, a little bit more, um, uh, uh, um, I, I would say guidance is probably a good term, uh, a little bit more of a resource base to work with. You're paying a little bit more, 
but you're getting um, more service. Some of the others are more streamlined. So it's a uh, quicker process, more efficient, uh, kind of uh, assumes that, that the farmer will be more independently, uh, but uh, the, uh, and I'm not here to speak on behalf of uh, Food Jet Alliance. I'm not here, I don't speak for them. I don't work for them. I'm just glad to be participating, but um, uh, I would say that of the three or four most, uh, most uh, the most, the busiest certifying agents in the region would be uh, Pennsylvania Certified Organic, um, NOFA New York, Northeast Organic Farming Association of New York, um, one that I like and one that I've directed people to to look closely at is called Bay State Organic Certifiers, which is, in fact, uh, the the historical NOFA Massachusetts organization that set up its own certification program. And uh, I like them. They're very efficient and they're very streamlined. Uh, and I'm not trying to pick winners or losers out of the pool. There's a lot more out there, but um, I would say that 90 probably 90 to 90, 90% of the certified farms in New Jersey are using one of those three certifying agents. Okay, um, so we've identified who sets the standards. We've identified uh, who does the work, the day-to-day, year-to-year work with the certified farmers. Any questions now before we kind of move into what John raised, the, uh, the organic system plan and how those are developed? Okay, the organic system plan is the document which a farmer uh, creates drafts to that provides an overview of the manner in which they will operate their farm. So it identifies all of the um, tangible elements. It identifies the fields that are going to be certified. It identifies the livestock, including a, a list of livestock. Uh, typically for cows, they get named. Typically for uh, uh, chickens or other birds, they tend to just go over and the size in the flock. Uh, it identifies the practices that will be used. Um, and there's an overlap between practices and materials. And uh, candidly, the practices section, which would include things such as um, uh, pest management, um, cover cropping, uh, crop rotation, uh, separation of organic and conventional product in terms of identity preservation, they tend to be on the more subjective side, particularly with things like crop rotations. Uh, farmers and certifying agents, I would say there's some well-established uh, norms that a farmer and a certifying agent will reach agreement on how to maintain a rotation. If you're raising vegetables, uh, it's mostly going to pertain to uh, keeping vegetables of the same family out of the same section of your certified ground on a year-to-year -year basis. Just basically good management practices. Uh, if you're doing row crops, they're going to expect something that involves a grain, a grass, a winter, a small grain. Things along those lines. There's no hard and fast rules over how farmers uh, develop those plants. Material side tends to be more restrictive because uh, that's more of an objective criteria. And one of the challenges of being an organic farmer is finding the the materials that will allow you to uh, operate in a manner that that meets your needs uh, within what's can be a subset of the materials that are out there and available to you. And I don't, uh, I was going to say this uh, at the beginning of the of the seminar, I am glad to have uh, an email conversation with anybody participating uh, about more specific details. I want to try to avoid going through the details, uh, trying to get into, you know, section 205, 203A, C3. You know, I, I don't think for our purposes tonight, but I, um, 
in terms of working with a food shed alliance i'm glad to stay in touch by email with people if you have follow-up questions that get a little bit deeper uh, this is what i do this is what i believe in and i know a number of the other people on the call feel similarly so uh, anything that will advance promote uh, educate people about organic farming i really mean what i say we we're not going to be, you know, we, it's a bleak future without the organic principles built into our food system. Um, so, the organic, and, and part of this, I'd like to emphasize for people for whom, you know, are considering certification, uh, it can seem very daunting. Uh, it can seem like there's a whole bunch of rules that I don't know anything about. Uh, it can seem like there's a, you know, record keeping is generally, it's mo not most people's favorite pastime favorite activity um it it is going to retire or require an initial investment of time energy uh concentration but there's an old kind of uh, adage in in the world world of organic search farmers they do uh it does require uh more planning and more record keeping but i think they would agree independent of the certification what organic means for the business they benefit better uh they they benefit from keeping these records farmers will say well i had to keep more records but you know what they 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 prove to be very useful um i've seen farmers you know uh, be able to keep such good records that and they can account for the caution including the labor allocation and they realize this crop i was losing money on this crop I, I I love growing it, um, it, but if I can't make money off it, can I keep growing it? Um, so the record keeping, I'm not gonna. I just want it to be clear that it's it's a significant responsibility, but it's doable. Anybody who's really farming as a business, really watching their expenses and maximizing their opportunities, um, it will not. Be excessively burdensome uh, and there is a natural back and forth between the, uh, the farmer developing the organic system plan and the certifying agent it's tough being a farmer in this situation because i always compare the farmer the family farmer to a somebody who's driving down the road uh and the they don't have uh the, there's no signs posted for the speed limit and their speedometer is actually broken. So they don't know how fast they're going and they don't even know how fast they are going. And that's, I, I really, I, I respect that. Um, that can be inducing a little apprehension, but um, it can be navigated. And part of what's on the uh, list of resources that I shared, I'll point to a couple here. Um, the top program, the top one national organic program, that's really rendering unto Caesar what is Caesar's. That's, that's the umbrella. All this at faith, you'd want to know who they are, where they are. There's not a great deal of, um, interaction that any family farmer is going to have with the USDA itself. Item two is called the Organic Integrity Learning Center, and it's a nice resource that, uh that usda has generated where they have a training modules uh, it's you know it's computer driven it's uh you know kind of a powerpoint format but they've done a nice job of taking significant aspects of the standards uh breaking it down and, and putting it into an educational format and that's that's really become i would say the go-to source for information uh on what does it mean to comply um there are you know quite a quite a few provisions in there seeds i won't get distracted on this subject i see uh some people on the call know me and know my <laughs> this is kind of my soapbox on the what seeds are allowed and under what conditions it'll take you some time to work through the form of, but you will get a good clear answer from usda and that wasn't always the case uh, I included um, Rodale Institute, uh, Organic Consulting. I know I I would gather most of our callers are from New Jersey, but um, in Pennsylvania, their services are provided for free. Uh, 
as, through a grant from the state, uh, State Department of Agriculture. I know that they're not, they do what they can to help people from other states, uh, and they are very, very capable. They are, um, I can't promise that they would not need to uh, assign a fee, but they're, they're not trying to return their investment based on the revenue from their consulting. They're definitely worth the call. Uh, if you want to get a little bit further, um, they're definitely a knowledgeable resource. Um, I included uh, two other uh, organizations here, New Jersey Department of Agriculture. I think that stands for the Office of Sustainable and Regenerative Agriculture. Uh, it is kind of uh, in itself, they're not in the certification business like they used to be. But uh, you can call there, you can get a fellow named Eric Bremer. And uh, he, he likes to talk about organic farming and organic certification, and he's, he's quite knowledgeable. So I just happened to see him at the, the NOFA Winter Conference. And again, if you're looking, I mean, if you're a farmer and you've probably got 25 questions about, you know, what do, what do I need to do to source animals from my farm? What do I need to feed from my farm? There are people out there, and I included myself in that list, um, who can give you baseline introductory uh, knowledge. And then, uh, very important, we also included NOFA, New Jersey, on that list of resources. Um, they're just, they have a long tradition here in New Jersey. Um, they, one thing that's exciting, and I'd say, uh, oh, here's a comment from Jason DeSalvo. Uh, Rodeo helped us fill out our application with PCO and we're invaluable for answering questions and helping us to understand the process. The work was all for free. Jason, are you in Pennsylvania or New Jersey? Jersey. And could I just ask briefly about the nature of your farm? Sure. It's a, um, can you hear me? I'll, yes. I'll do it. <clears throat> so as of, I guess, this year, Rodale is working for free in New Jersey too. Um, our farm is, it is, uh, we have 13 acres in agriculture, 10, or, 10 of them in small grains. Um, so we grow cereal grains for human consumption, and then two and a half acres in permaculture uh, perennial foods, um, where we grow 50 plus different things. Not all of them are in production yet, um, but they, they helped us through the certification process. We haven't gotten and certified yet, but we filled out our application. Okay. And um, what currently, uh, what current marketing programs are you, outlets, vent outlets are you using and where do you see yourself going? So we are right now selling wholesale through River Valley Community Grains, a wonderful partner of ours up here um, who, who works to work with small grain farmers and, and commercialize their crop. I'd like to, you know, take back a portion of that. We'll always work with them because we're we're we really like what they're about. But I'd like to get more of our stuff at the retail level purely for pricing, um, and that's where, you know, the organic seal really helps. Um, and so we were looking to differentiate ourselves that way by being able to sell our grain berries. Ultimately, we'll probably have to do the processor application too in order to sell flour. But this first year, we're just taking the step of getting the grain berries certified uh, so that we can say when we do mill flour, milled from 100% organic grain berries, and then maybe later we'll deal with processing. Very nice. You know, the, I mean, it's, would you agree that um, it's, it's not easy, but uh, <laughs> if you're, if you're in it, you know, if you're in it for the right reasons. I, I don't know. I'm not talking about. I've put an emphasis on the economic. I think the economics play an important role uh, in in keeping a business viable. Um, yep. But you also you also have to have a passion for it, uh, and and what it represents, what it is, um, or you know, because it, it's economics in and of itself is not going to drive you to do this. I mean, there. There, there, there are Correct. other ways. Yeah, uh, I don't know. I, I would, 
I would I would summarize it like this for any of you that are on the fence, because Deborah and I were on the fence for four years before deciding we've been farming organically and regeneratively, but did we really need the paperwork and headache? Um, filling it out, filling out the paperwork and getting your OSP set up and getting set up with the net, we're using PCO. It's a big undertaking, I'm not gonna lie. It takes a bunch of hours. It takes thinking about your farm differently than you were before. But I already see benefits as you alluded to, Mark, you know, it makes you think more cohesively about your farming. It makes you think ahead. It makes you foresee obstacles that you might not have realized until much later in the farming season. Um, I'm really happy with having done it. And yeah, it's a few bucks, you know, not a small amount of bucks, but you can get a lot of the, you can get a lot of the funds back um, now with the various programs. We also use the transition to organic um, the, the TOPP program, and we had a wonderful mentor also. So we had these two great resources between our mentor and Rodale, and we could have never done it without the two of them. I would have never had the guts to do it. So, you know, like you do consulting, the ability to get someone who's been through it before to explain it to you, it demystifies it, and it makes it a very tangible thing. And 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 it's not it's easier than I thought it was, but it's still a pain in the butt, if that means it. <laughs> yeah, uh, no doubt. Uh, is there anybody else um, who is at this stage of having initiated an organic system plan, of having uh, maybe had an inspection or currently certified? I know uh, I recognize uh, Dr. Heckman from Rutgers University on the call. He is a certified organic farmer. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Heckman, he bales more hay than pretty much any other professor in the land grant system. Uh, Joe, why don't you share a little bit about your experience with us? Hello, Mark, um, I'm listening in here. Um, so um, yeah, I was certified with the uh, New Jersey Department of Agriculture, now I'm with PCO working on the paperwork, um, but my system is pretty simple. Um, I just have one hay field, except one time I did grow some sweet, organic sweet potato there too. So I didn't certify the whole farm. So I qualify as a, a split operation. And um, one thing that um, I, uh, I think is worth mentioning is that, well, anytime you enter that field, you got to keep records of, okay, you. Uh, you brought over clean farm equipment. The machinery is cleaned out before you enter the field. Um, and sometimes I've used custom harvest. And so a farmer is coming in from another um, farm. And once again, they will want to, to know and be sure that the machinery is cleaned out. In that case, they may ask about like, are you bringing weed seeds or diseases onto your farm by that um, equipment coming from another farm? So those are some of the issues, but um, I, I think it probably gets a lot more complicated when you, excuse me, have many, many different kinds of crops. And so uh, mine is, is somewhat simple because it's, it's just hay. It's hay, but it's... Uh... Uh, Joe is a very good manager, so he's he has animals on his farm. He's taking manure from his animals. Well, um, there's a couple times yeah, that I've used. Um, um, it, it's Mark. Could I could I add a few things I, now that I you, you bring sure. that up? Um, I uh, um, sometimes bring in uh, horse manure, and so I have to get that trucker to. Uh, write a letter that it's just horse manure and nothing synthetic has been added to it and so on. Um, so you have to have documentation of that when you bring ma new materials on the farm that's gonna be used for soil there, fertility. Yeah, um, there, but otherwise there, I, I, use, I mostly use manure for my own farm, so. 
Yeah, it, and it's I mean it's a real farm. That's it's it's not a hobby. It's it's a real farm. Yeah. Um, what I was gonna say is that there is uh there can be an organic certification from the certifying agent standpoint, kind of a there's a risk. I'm not saying it's happening, but there's a risk of uh, kind of a death by a thousand cuts. I mean, if you have to make a record, you know, every time you blink in an organic field, uh, the time, the expense of uh, time more than anything else is going to be a disincentive. I'd like to make this observation. Um, the, the One of the successes in the standards is that the definition of a record is very expansive. Uh, so I do handling inspections, and I see uh, uh, there's a program called SAP that can track uh, in thousands of pounds of ingredients around the globe in real time. That That's a real record. <laughs> uh, there's also uh, uh, dairy farmers that I inspect that have a calendar on their barn wall that includes uh, a reference to um, uh uh, uh, a feed, feed ration, or a particular activity, administration of a, of a medication. Uh, say there's a cow that had uh, some some uh, uh, foot issues, put him in a, a, a bath with some fur. Boom, just write it on the calendar. That's a record. Uh, and when it comes to the equipment, the moving equipment, a lot of the younger farmers I've seen are comfortable with their phones. And if you have done something to the equipment like a clean out joe's talking about a custom operator they're going to want to clean out uh, their baler their combine um you, you you perform that practice which is a best management practice it's a good thing to do you take a photograph you don't even have to write it down it's time stamped uh, and so you can fade it with your records i mean if you record keeping again is not a person's favorite activity and we have to watch out that uh, the certifying agents just don't go overboard in what they're asking for. You kind of, kind of get a healthy balance there. So um, I wouldn't, you know, that's that's a, those are good considerations. Do we have anybody else on the uh, on the uh, uh, Zoom call where you are either currently certified or you have taken the even introductory steps with an organic system plan? Okay, I mean, I'm, I'll just keep going, but if, if anybody has relevant information, please contribute. Um, so we've talked about the development of the organic system plan. And again, we're, we're gonna keep this at, you know, uh, kind of a, a, an overview level. There'll be a back and forth between the certifying agent and the uh, farmer. They will um, essentially, read the organic system plan. What that means is that the certifying agent says, if this is what you're doing, if this is the materials you're using, these are the fields, these are uh, buffers, these are the animals, it's compliant with the organic standards, and this would be a certifiable farm. This is a certifiable farm. Then they'll arrange the inspector, uh, and the inspector will come out, um, schedule an inspection, for a crop farm, really no inspector needs more than two to three hours. Just don't, uh, and they probably won't uh, stay much longer than that. Livestock, it, it does get more complicated, but again, depending on the complexity of the operation, we're maybe looking at half a day. Um, and they are basically an eyes and ears uh, responsibility. They look at um, uh, the organic system plan, the associated records. They look at what's on site. Uh, if they see consistency, then they note that. If they see inconsistency, um, they would note that too. Their job is not to do the farm is organic or not, but to but to send in a useful report back to the certifying agent who has that responsibility of either granting certification or uh, uh, requesting changes uh, to the plan based on what was seen on site. It's I want people to understand it's kind of an important principle with organic certification. It's not a pass fail system. You're not going to come out of there with a score of 72 and you know, you need a curve to get certified. There's no 
numerical or grade-based system. The concept is a model of continuous improvement, which means that the farmer is is parameters of standards is doing the best uh, job they can given the given the current conditions on the farm, and uh, is committed to identifying and implementing improvements over time. So there's always been a healthy tension between the certified farmer and the certifying agent. With the certifying agent maybe pushing a little bit more. The organic farmer is saying, well, we don't live in a perfect world, so I can't commit to that. But, uh, you know, so there's, and it's meant to be constructive, collaborative, to be a win-win situation. It's not, uh, it, it's, it's not um, pass-fail. One area where the farmers have to be most uh, uh, conscientious is with their materials. Uh, material application can result in decertification of a field, a portion of a field. The certifying agents don't like to do that. Uh, and they are reluctant to do it, but under certain circumstances, they have to. Say, for example, a farmer inadvertently applied a prohibited fertilizer onto a portion of a field. The certifying agent could elect to decertify the crop. Uh, ground stays certified, crop is cannot be sold as organic. Worst case scenario, they can decertify the ground. And not to get too deep into the standards, but there's a three-year period um, of uh, no prohibited substances to get certified again. I'll just, I'll make this observation. I have been doing organic inspections for over 10 years. I'm over, uh, uh, well over a thousand organic crop and livestock. Uh, it's, I really can't recall this happening on any of the inspections that I've performed where, where somebody was retroactively found to have applied a prohibited, prohibited substance and lost part of their certification. I can think of less than five incidents in which um, something along those lines happened and they received, um, uh, there's one farmer who just he had a horrible Johnson grass problem. They're like, you know, I got to, then they had hay fields. They're like, I got to spray these areas. And they were demarcated, they were sprayed. He kept them out of uh, the organic harvest, did a separate conventional operation, and he waited for them to come back into his plan. It, it's not a punitive system, uh, and it's not it's not meant to be punitive. But when it comes to materials, there is there are bottom line um, responsibilities that certifying agent really can't look the other way. So um, once a farmer is inspected. And the issues that result from that uh, are resolved. They receive certification. The um, annual certification and annual inspection is required. So you will renew your you will renew the application. You will pay your certifying agent again, uh, and you'll have another inspection the following year. So we had good question earlier about costs of certification, and. Um, the certifying agents, and I want to address this because it's, 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 a, it's a fundamental consideration. The cost of an organic farm to be certified, uh, I would say, ranges from a low of around $750 uh, up to, I would say, maybe $1,200 for a more sophisticated operation. That's your fee from the certifying agent. That will be an annual fee that will cover uh, the review of your organic system plan. In most cases, it covers the inspection as well. There's a program that's called the Organic Certification Cost Share Program, which is funded through the federal government, which will reimburse uh, farmers for 75% of their certification expenses and that would be money that they pay directly to the certifying agent that couldn't be used to pay for a consultant, but uh, just what it, the actual tangible cost of certification, that is 75% of those costs up to $750. Um, for what it's worth, that certification cost share pro program applies to each scope. So if say you had, um, uh, an organic crop farm, and you also were raising uh, organic poultry. 
uh, you could get $750 back for both your crop organic system plan and the inspection and $750 back for your livestock organic system plan and inspection. Um, up to 75%, up to seven, $750 for each scope. Uh, and it also applies to processing. I didn't really bring that into the conversation earlier. It's it's processing is is more sophisticated uh, uh, type of organic system plan still can be done at the farm level. Uh, the most basic things you do in a farm are not considered processing. For example, you can harvest multiple uh, greens and make a salad mix. That's generally that's not considered a processed product, even though you are blending. Um, but let me, let me ask if anybody who's either been certified or, um, had wants to weigh in on the cost share program. It's one that has historically has a, uh, it's been, it's highly efficient. I mean, if it's going to cost you 15 hours to get your $750 back, you're going to ask yourself whether I really want to do that. It's not, it's managed through, uh, 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 FSA, USDA FSA, Farm Service Administration, and it's quite an efficient program. Um, and any other factors related to cost of the certification? I'd, I'd like to open the floor for questions and uh, comments. I do see that Jason added a question into the chat. How and when do you apply for that grant? The, the, that is, it's done annually. There is a, there'll be a notification uh, from, and the, the certifying agents really want to share this information with their clients because it makes, uh, it's, it's, it's a way of retaining clients. Um, and it's generally, there's a deadline by the end of the year i don't know i didn't track it exactly this year maybe in october or november there's a deadline to apply and by then you should have received your you should have re renewed your application you should have received your inspection you may or may not have uh, a renewal decision yet but you at least have had an invoice from your certifying agent that typically comes up front so the um the the deadline for applying is usually into the fall and then I would um, not having been certified, I can't speak to exactly when the payment comes, but I think they're relatively quickly. Alex, your hand is up. Hey, Mark, you uh, were my inspector many years ago at Sandbrook Meadow Farm in Stockton, New Jersey, but uh, just to speak yeah. to some of the speak to some of the kind of hindrances to organic certification i think obviously the main two that farmers talk about are the, the cost and the, and the administrative work the paperwork um i think you spoke to them well and including what jason had me? to say i think no just that you know these costs i think I, I don't think they're prohibitive i think they're very nominal i think in terms of what you're getting back and the and the the price points of what you're offering um, easily make it kind of justifiable to be certified organic, you know, in terms of that seven fifty to a thousand dollars to be certified organic. So I don't think that should be kind of deterrent. And then in terms of the administrative load, as you mentioned, a lot of these records just make you a better farmer. So um, yeah, they can take time, but I think on the whole. I think they're very kind of useful records that you have to keep. Um, and I don't think that, you know, anybody should kind of stray away from organic because of those two reasons. I think if you're a larger scale um, conventional operation, there are definitely more considerations in terms of, are you gonna make more money transitioning to organic? Um, but like you said, I think that's a little more of a, a value systems question than it is economical that's all and alex what are you uh are you what, what what are you doing currently in farming i manage the rucker student farm and so we are not certified organic but we operate organically and 
the only reason we're not certified organic is just because of buffering issues. We have research, research going on adjacent to our farm that could make that a little more complicated, but, uh, and we also sell, you know, direct to consumers. So, you know, we can have that conversation with customers saying that, you know, we grow using these practices and, um, yeah, so still farming, but uh, not yeah. certified organic. No, that's, that's a great, uh, that's a great um, gig, <laughs> uh, being on campus and uh, being with people who love getting their hands in the soil and the, uh, yeah, good to hear from you. Um, Safan, am I saying that correctly? Yes. The question she raised, or he raised, sorry, uh, are the prices of any different are prices any different for small urban farms, market garden style? We have many crops in a very small space. If it goes based on crop mix, that sounds expensive. No, there wouldn't be any added cost based on the number of crops that are being certified. Uh, and it sounds like you're in the produce, herb, maybe flower categories. Um, there should not be any additional revenue uh, based on the number of crops that are being certified. Um, Alex mentioned something a moment ago, and I, I gather there will be people on this call who are either currently engaged in ag production on the cusp of seeking to get into ag production, and you have to ask yourself, what are your, your customers? And it is true that, um, you know, this is where... Uh, that, that's where that kind of that market research really pays off. Um, there are certain crops, certain commodities where organic certification will make you stand out. Uh, there are other opportunities where direct access to your customer uh, or um, uh, well, direct access to your customer or other forms of uh, connecting with people. Uh, can enroll. It's really true that organic agriculture, um, there are many people who are uh, moving away from the conventional food supply because they have reservations about um, how, how, how it works. And I think those reservations are very legitimate. Uh, the conventional food supply is not working for most farmers, certainly not family farmers. It's not working for the environment. It's not working for consumers. Um, and so there's, there is a uh, 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 stream of consumers who, and I've always looked for a, a better word than consumer, and I can't really come up with one because we have producers and consumers. Well, the consumers do a lot more than just consume. I mean, they're part of the system. Anyway, that's kind of a, a long-term challenge for me. I don't like to really, I don't really like the term eaters either. It's just it's not really. Anyway, uh, for people who are moving, who are skeptical about the conventional food supply, organic remains their primary beacon. If they're looking for something different than conventional, they will be drawn to organic. What they might find is that there are other features, other. Um, aspects of a production system that that add value uh, and address the concerns they have about the conventional food supply and that's why in my introduction or my bios i always present myself as someone who works in organic local and sustainable agriculture uh and that's some times being low um, is of the greatest importance in terms of reaching consumers and saying you know i'm part of your community i'm part of your neighborhood um, you know, we, 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 you can participate here yourself. You can come and see what we're doing. Um, sometimes the sustainability aspect is something that can be communicated without organic certification in and of itself. So it's important to think about what your consumers are looking for. Uh, organic certification can, particularly in a specialty market, uh, especially that can create kind of a broader uh, added value, but it's not the only way that you can convey your value of what you're doing to your potential customers. Um, 
Stefan, do you want to just tell us if you don't have to, if you don't care to, but you want to just tell us a little bit about what the type of, of operation you either have going or um, what you see as a, a possibility? Oh, sure. Thank you. Thanks for asking. Um, I'm a very, 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 very tiny urban farm. <laughs> Um, I don't think I even hit a quarter acre, <laughs> but I am attempting to grow diversified ethnic vegetables and medicinal herbs. So all of my customers need organic. They they won't buy it unless it's organic. And my my farming practices are organic anyway. So I I'm gonna take the extra change. <laughs> okay. um, yeah. So definitely and, a firm believer. <laughs> you know, uh, a quarter acre is. It's more ground than people want involved in farm. I mean, a quarter acre can be a very productive farm uh, and generate a significant amount of revenue. So, um, but it sounds like this is the certification is is what you see is you know she is desirable at this time. Absolutely. So, and I'm following behind Alex. He's one of our teachers over at the Are You Ready to Farm program. And okay. He's got it down. Like we're following his script. <laughs> so, yeah, we're I mean, it's <laughs> it's so important. Um, you know, it's just it's really a tragedy that our our culture has turned away from food as you know what has always been found foundation, uh, cultural and personal sustenance and environmental sustenance. I mean, every culture on the planet has food ways, food systems that uh, our ancestors handed down to us. And they're really important. And um, it's just, it's sad to see how our culture has, you know, large, not largely, but uh, has often abandoned that in the past 50 years. And I, I just, my work really is to just reconnect people to where their food is coming from and to ask well, who's bringing it to you? Um, you know, what circumstances what's in it for them because <laughs> uh, we'd like to see them be able to keep doing it um and you know what what um what is the sand point what is healthy food um and then the thing that i've just never found i never found any other career that um that allowed people to look at that the the communality of sharing food it, it's just basic to being human and uh it's very rewarding so uh, and I think the urban farms are going to play a tremendous role in the future because people just need, you know, they need that one strawberry. That's the gateway, you know, that one strawberry or, you know, a great carrot or, you know, you know a, a bouquet of flowers um, that there's just no undervaluing how significant that could be in opening somebody's eyes and saying, you know, what what is really going on around around this what's okay um any other people need to um to weigh in currently i'm going to go back to my fancy outline i also included uh in the resource list we uh the hasa pennsylvania association for sustainable agriculture which is an organization that uh, it's it's been in operation for at least 30 years. And uh, they, they're quite vibrant and they really cross kind of the urban rural um, uh, boundary in terms of the type of food systems that they're active in. So they definitely started more as like a rural farm, family farm um, uh, orientation. And then over time as uh, more of an urban focus and urban food systems has moved into the picture. They've they've moved quite well into that in that realm as well. They have, they have a great annual, um, and we just had our NOFA annual conference, which is also kind of covering those rural urban um, uh, boundary crossing those rural urban boundaries. Great places to go meet people who have sh similar interests, shared resources. Um, and so I, I wanted to include them as well. Let's see, John, I want to come back to you. You had you had two questions about about hydroponics and about uh, university. Uh, yep. Yeah. Hey, hey, Mark. Yep, yeah, that's right. 
Um, so, hydroponics, uh, is, yeah. Hydroponics has been um, a fairly controversial subject within organic certification. Um, we have seen hydroponic systems certified. Um, there, it's it's doable under kind of a very narrow reading of the standards. Um, there has been a lot of uh, uh, certification. It's an, a huge industry uh, for crops, uh, tomatoes, peppers, uh, but also quite a few of the cane fruits, blueberries, blackberries, um, where they're they're functionally um, um, hydroponic systems uh, operating without soil or with a very stripped down uh, definition of soil. Uh, the USDA has uh, sanctioned certification of these systems. They're not the, that like an independent farmer would use. They're they're definitely commercial scale. I know you're very experienced in commercial agriculture, so you know what you know a, a fifty acre greenhouse looks like. I mean, it's kind of hard to conceive of that, but there are plenty of them out there. Um, and so hydroponic has has become certified under organic, but not so much at you know the family farm, local farm level. It is an option, but it's it's definitely been more tailored to uh, industrial scale production and all it's it's become a very contentious issue for example uh, Canada the Canadian organic standards they don't allow hydroponic production under and you can't call it organic in Canada but they can raise a hydroponic crop to the NOP standard and sell it in the United States as organic and uh, so there's 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 a lot of that going on like hundreds of millions of dollars and We've also seen a really significant expansion of the cane fruit certification, what are functionally hydroponic systems. And, and uh, I was in, um, uh, I'm actually in, in Pittsburgh tonight because I'm out here doing some, uh, uh, I was doing a handling inspection today. And I, so I had time after work before here and I said, I drove by Trader Joe's. And so, but it really doesn't matter if you go to a Trader Joe's or a Wegmans or a food co-op or Acme or, one of the they all the produce sections have um, a table full of fruit uh, in you know it's February and a lot of this fruit is certified organic and a lot of it candidly is coming from the southern hemisphere and I don't think that it that it it's going to taste that good and I don't think it's going to be um, you know necessarily the best for the farm workers or the environment uh, and that's where there's really are two standards. You know, there's an organic industrial standard and there's an organic family farm standard. Um, so organic family hydroponic production is an option, but it's, it's, I mean, not as it's obviously under developed relative to the acre greenhouse, but also you just, you don't see it. You don't see it very much. Um, but what was, what was the question about the university that you had? Well, I think that it's probably irrelevant just due to the size of the, but, um, but are universities eligible and are there, um, I'm, I'm sure they are, but are there different um, requirements uh, than, you know, everybody else? In terms of like a research station? No, this wouldn't be a research station. It would be- Being certified? Uh, right, it would be just being certified. Yeah, um, we we have uh, pretty much every land grant university has some certified organic ground. Uh, Rutgers has some. Um, Penn State has some. Rutgers and Penn State have, you know, they've dipped a toe in the water for organic. I can't say that they've plunged deeper than that. Uh, but I just got back from a conference in uh, Madison, Wisconsin last week, and some of the Midwest. Eastern land grants uh, have, have really made quite a significant plunge. So University of Wisconsin, Minnesota, Ohio State, they have junior faculty members who are climbing the ranks in their department whose career is uh, based on an organic research program. And I mean, even 20 years ago, that would have been uh, just out of the question. It just wouldn't have happened. Uh, 
somebody for a young faculty member to stake out a career path in organic certification. It just this was going to happen because uh, it just was wasn't there. But yeah, we see uh, we see we do see um, certified ground on uh, ag research station farms. And I think uh, I think the fellow who was on earlier who talked about uh, their their grain operation and their uh, their their smaller wild cropping operation. Um, it's a very interesting time because organic has had their on Capitol Hill in Washington, uh, and we've seen a substantial increase in the amount of funding going to. Um, organic promotion, organic research, uh, there are, no, it is not proportionate to organics role in the agricultural economy. I mean, if, if somewhere the, you know, if, if somewhere in uh, some metrics, organic could be three, four, 5% of the organic marketplace across all categories, it's going to be single digit. It's going to be more more than two, less than five, probably, but it's it's real dollars. It's real farms. I mean, California organic produce is a ten billion dollar a year business. That's that's real farming, um, and we've we've seen a significant amount of resources dedicated to organic research, um, uh, organic funding through NRCS, um, organic funding through the National Organic Program. This uh, uh, transition to organic partnership program that is brought uh, the test manages for uh, the grant from that program test manages the food shed alliance this those those dollars are unprecedented uh, for promotion of promotion and education and training it, it's there's never been resources like this available um i was i was candidly i was amazed uh so most of my knowledge is here in new jersey and somebody told me, well, the uh, State Department of Agriculture just awarded NOFA New Jersey a million dollar grant uh, for promotion of organic farming in the state. And I thought about that. I'm like, New Jersey Agriculture, I'm like, you sure you don't mean USDA through some form, through one of this top program or there's, there's other types of funding? And they said, no, it's New Jersey Department of Agriculture has put a million dollars into NOFA New Jersey to promote and educate, train, get people in transition. It, it, that's never happened before. So, you know, so if you dig long enough, you usually get into like best of times, worst of times scenario. But in terms of resources, the raw allocation of resources, I would say uh, this is a very good time for sure. And it's it's important that we capitalize on it and, and show return on investment. I mean, that's funny. I sound like this business guy. You know, I'm always talking about cost benefit analysis and return on investment. You know, I can't even balance my checkbook. You know, it's it's not it's not something that's like hardcore with me, but I've really over time come to, you know, address commercial it, it, commercial activity has to be run as a business. Have to be, particularly if you're running it yourself and you're not getting paid by somebody else to do it you have to be locked in on your cost of your expenses and being really honest about that i mean a lot of farmers will you know they'll farm all year and like if their revenue uh the revenue they generate is equal to their expenses they're like wow i had a great year then they realize they didn't pay themselves you know for the 80 hours a week that they invested so you have to be pragmatic about it because uh you know loving it is is critical too but um if you don't you know, if you don't love it, um, you out sooner or later because it's it's not a way to get rich, but it is it can be extremely rewarding. So I'm going to start. Um, if uh, anybody, if I don't hear from uh, any more questions, I'm going to pick on a few people who just showed up uh, and ask them if they wouldn't mind telling us a little bit about their. Operation. I'm going to start with Rebecca. Now you're not obligated to to jump into the conversation. I know you just checked in to listen, but we we talked about um, a couple of things: value added, 
production, uh, berries being uh, item herbs. And we also talked about being able to communicate to your customer without being um, necessarily certified. And then your that very nice uh, 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 image from your farm, sustainable farm, uh, sustainable permaculture, three birds farm. Could you just tell us a little bit about, about your operation? Hi, thank you for your uh, for talking tonight. Um, yeah, so we are transitioning to be organic. We do um, we basically do um, can't even think cuttings yeah. for um, medicinal berries, elderberries, aronias, um, and we're also doing um, herbs as well. Herb um, from seed or from cutting. Um, herbs from seeds. And then we're selling the cuttings um, to farms around the United States. Yep. This, I would say that, you know, from just that introduction to what you're doing, certification definitely has um, potential, you know, significant potential for you. You are a high value uh, commodity. Um, and they're not so much with the aronia or the um, elderberry, which I definitely believe in. I mean, these are these are um, really potent medicinal food foods. But you know, if people want to buy an inexpensive herb, um, they can do that. I mean, there's they can go to Lowe's, they can go to Home Depot, and you know, they can get what they pay for, but they're available. Whereas if you're growing something of superior quality. Uh, organic is a good way of, of, of designating that, identifying that. And um, you also have a system that would probably be relatively minimal on inputs. I mean, it's more of a controlled growing environment in terms of the soil and the amendments. Um, um, so in terms of, we talked a lot about kind of return on investment. Uh, how hard is it going to be? How much is it going to cost on one side of the scale versus what uh, what return on investment can we see on the other side of the scale? Yeah, definitely the perennials are a lot easier to manage than an annual farm. Yep. What's the number one What's the number one challenge that every organic farmer faces? Are you questioning me? <laughs> I thought I'd ask. I mean, it's one that's kind of. I mean, an operation, it may not, it, I don't think it'll be as, as difficult for you as it is for most crop farmers. But I, I, I typically say it's weeds. Um, there's just, there's just, <laughs> it's not yeah. a lot of good options. That's the just inevitable. Because my husband's yeah. listening in. Yeah, yeah, definitely the weeds. Yeah. 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 We rely a lot on molding, uh, mowing, a lot yeah. of um, mulching, a, a lot of mulching. A lot of uh, we're we're starting some composting. We're gonna start do it. Uh, we have um, a lot of uh, row cropping, that kind of stuff. So we deal with raised beds. Yep. A lot. Um, yeah, we consolidate and we just leave parcels with weeds. It's just how it goes, and we yep. get beneficial stuff out of that. We get a lot of praying mantis, that kind of thing. So. Yep. And I'm gonna I'm gonna call on on Luke Tarvin, who's been here from the beginning. Just uh, curious about what brought you here, and and if you you'd like to weigh in on. Okay. Not necessary. Um, and I think the other one we haven't heard from, uh, Karen. Anything to, to to contribute or it's okay. It's not, you didn't sign up to, uh, it's not like open mic at the Apollo or anything. It's just thought I'd share the floor if you had anything you wanted to add. Nope. Thank you, Luke. Um, yes.
Okay, now I'm lost because my technology guide is. Yes. Sorry, I was trying to put something in the chat there. Okay. Um, where do we where do we stand? Um, I think you know if nobody else has anything that they that has a as a burning question or anything like that, I think um we can wrap up and I will definitely follow up with everybody with um some more resources. Oh, I see Luke's adding some stuff in the chat here. So I have a startup chestnut orchard. Wow. Inherited two acres of certified blueberries um on on farm. That's that's awesome. I'm very interested in chestnuts. That's really cool. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm also I'm very interested in blueberries because the commercial high bush blueberry hybridized in the state of New Jersey, right down in Hamilton. And uh, it's a great story about the lady who kind of led the initiative. No one person ever does one thing, but um, Elizabeth White certainly uh, will be remembered for her uh, her uh, cultivation and uh, hybridization of the of the high bush blueberries a great story for jersey and uh, another crop that has you know blueberries have clearly been identified in the public as um, beneficial and they are they're wonderful uh health food product uh and it, it makes a difference if your blueberries coming up from Peru. Uh, and I'm not joking. I mean, there are hundreds of millions of dollars of blue, organic blueberries coming up from, from Peru on an annual basis. Uh, that can't possibly match um, what a New Jersey organic blueberry can offer people. So that's, but that's a lot of picking, two acres. <laughs> yeah, but I, I, I want to thank Tess for inviting me and Eric, who's uh, also been on the call. Uh, Food Shed Alliance is another one of the organizations that's been, they really work hard and uh, they have a great message and I was very pleased. I want to just extend the invitation. Uh, Tess can put my email in the chat box. I, you can tell I do. This is what I love to do. If you've got a question, just send it my way. I do my best to help you. Thank you so much, Mark. I really appreciate your time. And uh, I appreciate everybody joining us tonight and for the, the contributions to the conversation. This has been really awesome. Um, in order for us to provide like the best possible educational experiences for everybody, um, I would really, really appreciate it if you would go to this form and give us some feed feedback. Um, that'll help us kind of organize uh, sessions like this and really tailor the the offerings to what our audience is looking to learn. So um, I was going to try to put it as a poll in here that you could just do live, but that wasn't working. So <laughs> um, I will fix those permissions. Thank you. Um, clearly, Mark seems to be more in the 21st century on the technology than I am today, but Please. <laughs> I Please. will... Uh, I'll edit that right now. And again, I really- How about this in a text in my life? How 21st century. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, and let me um, let me just put your email in the chat as well. And I will definitely um, follow up with everyone who has been on the call and who registered with um, the recording of this session and all of the resources that we talked about and shared. Um, yeah, so I appreciate everybody's time. And if you're able to fill out that survey, once I fix those permissions, I really appreciate that too. Thanks so much, Mark. Thanks everyone. Thank you everyone, take care.